Okay, like I told you in class, we are going to cover only the essentials from now on through chapters 9 and 10. So in 9.1, I've gone through and picked out the things that I know you need to know to be successful in later math, but also what you need to be successful with your understanding for building proofs. So the first thing we're going to do is combine 9.1 and 9.2. These are what are involved. Let's get going. Okay, so we're going to start with conditional statements. They are logical statements. They have two parts, the hypothesis and the conclusion. When a conditional statement is written in the if-then form, the if part becomes the hypothesis and the then part becomes the conclusion. If you remember these symbols, if P then Q, or P implies Q, then that will help you remember uh, when we learn about converses, it will help you with your understanding there. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of examples on, from your journal on page 252. So uh, we, they want you to rewrite the conditional statement in if-then form. So don't assume that what comes first is always your if. Because if you look at this, the because is what has to be true in order for this to be. So your statement would be if x equals negative 1, then 13x minus 5 will equal negative 19. Okay, when you're writing one about shapes, then you want, to dis you want to remember that you have to decide what the shape is first. So you're going to say, if a polygon is a triangle, then the sum of the measures of its interior angles is 180. So be very careful when you're trying to do this. Okay, now in your exploration and in the book, it goes over whether a statement is true or false. And I'm only putting this in there here for your understanding. Um, it's not crucial for this chapter, but I want you to understand it so that if you see something like this, you can say, oh yes, that's true, or yes, or no, that's false. So a hypothesis can be either true or false, and a conclusion can be either true or false. For the conditional statement to be true, the hypothesis and conclusion do not necessarily both have to be true. So we're going to determine whether each conditional statement is true or false. So if yesterday was Wednesday, then today is Thursday. That's true if yesterday was Wednesday. Okay, Thursday always follows Wednesday. If an angle is acute, then it has a measure of 30 degrees. Well, the angle might be acute, but it does not have to have a measure of 30. It could be 32, it could be 76. So that one is false because 30 degrees is only one example of an acute angle. If a month has 30 days, then it's June. False for the same reason as the last one. There's a lot of months that have 30 days. If an even number is not divisible by two, then nine is a perfect cube. Well, the first thing I wanna notice is all even numbers are divisible by two. So that one is false. And nine is a perfect square. It is not a perfect cube. So that is also false. So guess what? That makes this statement true because both, hypothesis, because both the hypothesis and the conclusions are false. The conditional statement is true. We're not gonna be doing any of the true-false comparisons, but this is really important that you understand this difference, okay? All right, now we're gonna try rewriting a statement in if-then form. So we're, gonna, we're not gonna worry about the colors, but we're gonna rewrite the conditional statement in if-then form. So we need to remember that if an animal is a bird, so the first thing you have to do is, if this is what it is, then it will have feathers, okay? And you can see the red is the hypothesis, and the blue is the conclusion. Okay, if you are in Texas, then you are in Houston. Okay, well, oh, wait a minute. You are in Texas if you are in Houston. So we're gonna turn it around. If you are in Houston, then you are in Texas. Okay, kind of messed that one up. <laughs> okay, now a negation of a statement is the opposite of the original statement. To write the negation of a statement, you write the symbol for negation before the letter. So this means not P, okay? So the negation of each statement, the ball is red, the ball is not red. The cat is not black, the cat is black. So those are the two answers that you need there. So if it's already negative, then it becomes positive. A negation is the opposite, okay? All right, now these are very important. 
we, we mostly use these in IM1 and IM2, these first two, the regular and the con converse. We will also use inverses, but they're algebraic inverses in IM2, so you won't be writing them as if-then the, if statements. But like I told you, those symbols will help you. So you have your original conditional statement, and that is if p then q. So it's the p arrow q. The converse is when you reverse it and say if q then p. So the converse is the opposite of the conditional statement. You switch the p and the q. Okay? Then we have the inverse. To write the inverse of a conditional statement, you negate both the hypothesis and the conclusion. So you take the original statement and you just say not in front of it. Alrighty? And then for the contrapositive, so this is the opposite of this one, the contrapositive is the opposite of the converse. So you can remember that the cons go together. Okay? And so this would be if not or not if not q, then not p. So this also goes over whether they are true or false, but um, you can look at this. If two statements are both true or both false, then they're called equivalent statements. But that's just something that you might want to remember. Okay? But definitely know the differences between each of these. Um, just because a conditional statement and its contrapositive are both true, that's this, the original, and the contrapositive, does not mean that the converse and the inverse are both false. The converse and inverse could also both be true. So you have to look at each statement on its own. Okay, so we're going to write related conditional statements, and then we're going to decide if they're true or false. So, uh, let P be you are a guitar player, and let Q be you are a musician. So write each statement in words, then decide if it's true or false. So the conditional statement is if P, if you are a guitar player, then you are a musician. musician. And that is true, because if you can play the guitar, you're a musician, whether you're good or bad. Okay? Now, remember, we're going to do the converse now. That means we're going to switch it. So we're going to say, if you are a musician, then you are a guitar player. Well, what if I'm a cello player, or a piano player, or a bongo player? So that is not necessarily true. So that would be false. Okay? All right, the inverse is where we put the negation of the conditional statement. So if you are not a guitar player, then you are not a museum, a musician. And so that one uh, is false because you could be, you could not be able to play the guitar, but you might be another kind of musician, piano, organ, whatever. Okay. Then the contrapositive. So notice we've got a true, and we've got false, and we've got false. Now we think about the contrapositive. This is the reverse of the converse. So this one says, if you're not a musician, then you're not a guitar player. Well, that's true, because uh, if you're not a musician at all, then you're not any kind of musician. So that is true. Okay? So the main thing is, you have to recognize them each for what they are. Okay? You want to make sure and look through them each time. Okay, so decide whether each statement about the diagram is true. So this is asking you to examine the diagram and see if each one's true. Okay? So the first one, AC, that's this one, is perpendicular to BD. And we know that's true because of that symbol right there. So that is true. Okay? The right angle symbol indicates that the lines form a right angle. Okay, angle AEB uh, let's erase this so we can see. Angle AEB, that's this one, and CEB are a linear pair. And yes, they are. They form a line. So that is true. Okay. And then EA, that's this one, and EB are opposite rays. And that's false because opposite rays form a line. So that is not true. Okay. All right, so you want to be able to judge things and be able to say, what information can I get from this picture? Okay, I, can, I see that this is 90 degrees. That would mean that this is 90 degrees by vertical angles. So there's lots of things I can decide from looking at this picture. Can I say that BD bisects AC? No, I can't say that because there are no symbols 
telling me that those that AE and EC are congruent. So make sure you read your diagrams whenever you're solving a problem. Okay, so a biconditional statement is a special conditional statement. It's when a con conditional statement and its converse are both true, you can write them as a biconditional statement. And if a and you would write it like this. You change it and you put the words if and only if, and then you put the symbol either way. So the arrows go both ways. So here's an example. Okay, so we have a definition. I'll rewrite the definition of perpendicular lines as a single biconditional statement. So here's our definition. If two lines intersect to form a right angle, then they are perpendicular lines. Okay, so that's our definition. And our statement would be if two lines form, inter two lines intersect to form a right angle, then they are perpendicular lines. There's our if then. Now we're going to write the converse. If two lines are perpendicular, then they intersect to form a right angle. Well, we know that's true. Since this is true and this is true, then we can rewrite it as a biconditional. Two lines intersect to form a right angle if and only if they are perpendicular. In other words, both things have to be true. Now, where does this come into being? Well, later on when we're getting statements, uh, theorems, sometimes you'll get a theorem and you'll also get a converse. But there are a few theorems that are written as biconditionals. Those are the ones you have to begin, be careful with because you could use them either way. So you could say, because this is a definition, you could say that these are right angles, therefore they're perpendicular, or you could say these are right, uh, these are perpendicular, therefore they're right angles. So you can go either way with a theorem if it's written in the if and only if uh, form. Okay. All right. So rewrite the definition of a right angle as a single biconditional statement. If a right angle, if an angle is a right angle, then its measure is 90 degrees. That's true. The converse of that is. If an angle has a 90 degree measure, then it's a right angle, and that is also true. So we can say if an angle is a right angle, or a right, an angle is, so you take off the if, an angle is a right angle if and only if its measure is 90 degrees. Okay? Then we're going to rewrite this one as a single biconditional. If Mary is in theater class, then she will be in the fall play. If Mary is in the fall play, then she must be taking theater class. So we're going to write that as Mary is in the fall play if and only if she is taking theater class. So you want to think about that. She's not definitely going to be in the fall play because of theater because she might not want to be. But if she is in the fall play, then she must be in the theater class. So you would write it this way. Okay? So only people that are in the theater class are allowed to be in the fall play. Inductive and deductive reasoning. So the first thing you want to look at is, uh, we have some Latin here for you. So the word in, it's a prefix, meaning it goes before a word, and it means toward or up to. D, prefix, is down from. So we're going to think of down from a rule, or using a pattern or an example to come to a conclusion, up to a conclusion. Conclusion. <laughs> okay, there we go. And then duck, they both have that part, to lead and to think. So it's going to lead you to the rule or the conclusion. And then shun is the act of. Okay, so now we're going to put those two together. Induction uses specific examples to make a conclusion. Maybe you find a pattern or something like that. So you apply, you apply observations to the next problem. So you're thinking, okay, this worked this, this worked here, this worked again, therefore I can conclude this. A deduction uses a general rule to make a conclusion. In other words, you know there's a rule out there, so you think down from the rule. Okay, so now we're going to talk about inductive reasoning. 
Recall that a conjecture is an unproven statement about a general mathematical concept that is based on observations. You use inductive reasoning when you find a pattern in specific cases and write a conjecture for the general rule. So this is how we use inductive reasoning. We have to create the pattern that proves it. Here's an example. So we're going to take the numbers 3, 4, and 5 because they're called conjecture consecutive integers. In other words, they're one right after the other. Same with 11, 12, 13, you know, any numbers that are right after each other. So we're going to make a test con a conjecture about the sum of any three consecutive integers. So we're going to say, well, if I add 3, 4, and 5, what does that equal? It equals 12. And that's the middle number times 1, 2, 3. Let's try 10, 11, and 12. 10, 11, 12 equals 33. Huh, that's the middle number times 3. 7, 8, and 9 equals 24. Huh, that's the middle number times 3. So now that we've done a few patterns with this, we're going to make our conjecture. And the conjecture we're going to make is the sum of three, any three consecutive integers is 3 times the second number. And that totally is true because, if you think about it, Test your conjecture using other numbers, and if you can't find any examples that don't work, then you can be then you'll know it's right. The thing you need to think about is if you take one away from 18 and give it to 16, okay, then you get 17, 17, and 17. And that's why it works. So I just thought I'd show you that just to give you a little bit of an example. Okay, we're not going to talk about the law of detachment or law of syllogism. We're just going to talk about deductive reasoning. So this uses facts, definitions, accepted properties, and the laws of logic or rules to form an argument. This is different from inductive reasoning, which uses examples and patterns. So now we want to decide which one's which. So we're going to decide whether this is inductive or deductive reasoning. So every time Monica kips a ball up in the air, it returns to the ground. So they're saying that Monica is kicking the ball up a few times like this, and it's always coming down and bouncing. Okay, it's hitting the ground every time. So the next time Monica kicks a ball up in the air, it will return to the ground. So we can see that she established a pattern. She did a bunch of examples and figured out that it's always going to come down to the ground. Therefore, this is inductive reasoning. Okay, now we'll try another one. All reptiles are cold-blooded. Right away, tell yourself that's a rule. Then you read the rest of it. Parrots are not cold-blooded. Therefore, the parrot is not a reptile. Well, we figured that out using a rule. Now, we might, always, we might think this is silly and might not even need to say that, but we have an established rule. And therefore, this is deductive reasoning because facts about animals and the laws of logic are used to reach the conclusion. Okay? Alrighty. Okay, so the one thing you need to remember is to show that a conjecture of true is true, any true, you must show that it's true for all cases. To show that it's false, you only need one counterexample. A counterexample is a specific case for which the conjecture is false. So my favorite that I always use in my classes is I'll look at my classroom and I'll say, okay, everybody in this class is younger than 15. And a lot of times everyone will say, oh yeah, that's true, that's true. But it's not, because Mrs. Carter's in the class too. I am the counterexample. So when you're trying to think of what a counterexample is, it's the one thing that will prove your conjecture false. So here's another example. A student makes the following conjecture about the sum of two numbers. Find a counterexample to disprove the student's conjecture. The sum of two numbers is always more than the greater number. So they're saying 2 plus 3 is greater than 3. So that's true, isn't it? But what about 2 plus negative 3 or negative 2 plus negative 3? Negative 5 is not greater than the greater number, which is negative 2. Since I have a counterexample, the conjecture is false. So as you're doing your homework tonight, remember you're going to study induction, deduction, and counterexamples. Go back to negations, converse, inverse, those kind of things. Those are the things I want you to remember 
from Unit 9.1 and 9.2. Okay, take care.